Welcome to Session 1 in Stream 3, Problem Solving, Success Stories, and Lessons Learned. Our first speaker today is Mark Holjakin, who is speaking on the Lessons Learned Scaling a Free Moving Service for Survivors and Managing Survivor-Centered Organizational Growth. If you're in the wrong session, please navigate to the session you are looking for through the menu on the left of your screen by clicking Sessions and then clicking on the session you would like to attend. A passionate social justice leader, Mark founded Shelter Movers while on parental leave in 2016. Struck by how dangerous and complicated it can be for survivors attempting to leave an abuser, Mark developed the innovative survivor-focused moving service with the guidance of local women's shelters. Shelter Movers, volunteer-powered service, fills a critical gap in Canada's social safety net as the only one of its kind in Canada. The organization currently moves thousands of families in crisis annually in cities across the country. Prior to this, Mark spent 15 years working in government relations, program evaluation, and policy development, providing expertise to the public service and private corporations, including Enbridge, Accreditation Canada, the Council of Academic Hospitals of Ontario, and the Health Profession Regulatory Advisory Council. Mark sits on several boards, including the Betty de Jong Foundation in Ontario and the Solid Grounds Legal Clinic in Nova Scotia. In 2022, Mark was awarded the Governor General's Meritorious Service Medal for his work with shelter movers. He holds a Master of Arts in Anthropology, focusing on the Austronesian Indigenous Society's resistance to cultural hegemony. And Mark lives in Toronto, Canada with his wife, Megan, and their three lively children. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Helena, and thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, that was a mouthful. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I, uh, I was really honored to, uh, to have the chance to speak with you today uh, and tell you all a little bit about our work uh, and more specifically shelter movers growth and uh, plans for scaling across Canada. Um, as you heard in the intro, um, I started this uh, in my basement, um, in my slippers with my baby next to me about six years ago. Um, I was uh, working in the private sector and, uh, and, and with the birth of our third child, um, just sort of realizing uh, that, uh, that Clarice had sort of um, hit the lottery uh, with family. She would be born into a loving family with means to take care of her. And, and I thought about families in my own community and, and specifically um, families who, who might not be able to give their kids that safe place to sleep at night. Uh, and that, that lit a fire in my belly. And I started researching the experience of women um, experiencing abuse in Toronto. Uh, I'm from Nova Scotia originally, grew up in Dartmouth. Um, married up, uh, married my wife, uh, and we moved to Toronto. Um, so here I am downtown Toronto on parental leave and, uh, and realizing maybe I could do something to be useful to my community. Um, and, I, and I quickly realized uh, that uh, the women uh, or anyone fleeing abuse, but particularly women fleeing abuse, experience um, a high degree of, of cost and risk uh, when they do that. And whether we have uh, police available or shelters available, if she can't get out, if she can't leave with her belongings or if she has to leave and leave everything behind, um, are we really setting her up for success? And so the idea for Shelter Movers was born. I, as you heard, I, I met with women shelters locally and, and started refining the model. And then I started renting trucks, lots and lots of trucks going out four or five times a week after the kids would go to bed to move families and test the model and refine it and identify and mitigate risk. Uh, so that's that's uh, six years ago, almost seven years ago now, and, and so fast forward to today, and and the organization has grown at a rate that I had not uh, predicted. Uh, we operate now in in uh, six Canadian cities. Uh, we are opening our seventh city in Moncton, New Brunswick, in the next couple months, um, and and uh, and and we have uh, plans now to expand across the prairies, uh, adding six additional cities over the next four years, effectively doubling the size of the organization. And so that's, that's my talk with you today. Um, uh, a little bit more about the organization just for background. So we are a, a nationally registered federal, uh, federally registered charity. We have a board of directors, about 13 people. It's a three and a half million dollar uh, operation in terms of our expenses. Uh, we have 2,100 volunteers nationally, and we are moving about 130 families every month in those six cities. Uh, but it didn't start there. It was me and, a, and a, as I said, a van and a couple of volunteers uh, just sort of muddling our way through this and learning, constantly learning and constantly listening to our clients and adapting and improving. 
And I think that probably is where I'll start with our talk is our commitment to the families we're serving starts with us listening to them. I think it's a, it's a common mistake in folks who are looking to scale an organization to uh, pay too much attention to the administrative growth, to the, the workforce planning, and uh, not paying enough attention to maintenance of quality and a constant focus, on, a laser focus on the people you're serving. So we have, uh, we add a new, a new chapter almost every year. Usually the growth is organic. It's usually someone in the community who says, we love what Shelter Movers is doing, or I did, my cousin did this in Ottawa. We want to do this in Vancouver. And we start that discussion and, and we train them. And, and in order to make sure that we are growing responsibly, we've developed a number of protocols and processes that our chapters uh, need to follow. So Shelter Movers is a very centralized organization. Uh, and maybe that's the second message is, is ma maintain control. I know that sounds a little controlling, uh, but you, you, you do need to maintain a, a high degree of, uh, of, of power and influence over your sites as you grow, because people are passionate and people are creative um, and you want to uh, direct that passion and creativity towards solutions that are uh, replicable across all sites. What we can't have is uh, Toronto moving families out of abusive homes and then uh, Waterloo moving them out of abusive homes and then painting their apartment and then furnishing it. I mean, it would be lovely if they did, but what we need is standardization. We want at Shelter Movers to ensure that survivors receive the same level of care regardless of, of geography. And so the scope of our organization, I say no to a lot of great ideas, um, or I say not yet to a lot of great ideas because we are focused on our one primary service. And so it's very tempting to branch out and try new types of services to add on. But we've decided as an organization that because we are so unique and because we're filling this, this gap in our social safety net, that we're going to do this one thing really, really well. And we're going to do it over and over and over and over until we grow to a size where Shelter Movers is a household name and that uh, everyone in society thinks of it as, you know, if you're in trouble and you need to get out, you just call Shelter Movers and they'll be at your door the next morning with trucks. Um, we also have, uh, so our, a bit about our service, um, as a reminder for those who don't know what we do, um, our, our service is volunteer powered. As I mentioned, we have a little over 2,000 volunteers nationwide. And, uh, and basically, we receive our, our clients by referral. So we work primarily with women serving organizations. We do serve people across the whole gender spectrum. So we don't really care who it is. Uh, but our, our, as we all know on this call, that this is a gender-based violence issue is, is primarily about men hurting women. And this is important to call out um, uh, because it is so, so uh, widely skewed that way. So we receive referrals from our, our agency partners, uh, whether they're women's shelters or sexual assault centers, uh, social workers, teachers, whatever, um, and, uh, and we form a team based on our volunteer base uh, available at that time. Uh, we may need to bring in police, or if that's not appropriate, we have access to private security. Uh, we have storage facilities where we'll gather and keep her belongings for as long as she's in shelter. Uh, we have um, language interpreters in case she doesn't speak English or French. And we have relationships with pet fostering services in our sites to make sure that uh, if, he's, if he's threatening to harm the pets or if she thinks there's a risk or if she's staying because of the pet uh, uh, at all, we can uh, make sure that the pet has a safe place to go if the shelter can't take, can't take them. So we, we form this group according to her needs and her priorities. We deploy the group on the day that we've negotiated with her and, her and the referring agency and uh, we gather up for things. Um, we have uh, access to trucks and vans and cars and, the, and all the littler things, the critical things like car seats and things like that, that she may not be able to take with her um, if it tips off uh, the, the, uh, the ex-partner or the abuser that she's planning on going. So we, uh, we say we're ninjas. We're, we're in, we're out. No one really saw us coming. We, we, don't wear, we don't wear our branded clothing at all. We're just plain clothes. We're there to pick up something for a friend. We use unmarked vehicles. Uh, and uh, it allows us to operate with a level of discretion that keeps everybody safe. Uh, and so when we grow, getting back to our scaling operation, when we grow, we need to make sure that every move happens exactly the same way, 130 times every month. Uh, of course, things come up, there are hiccups, uh, trucks break down, the client uh, can't make it on that particular day, things happen. We, we work with all those variables, but we've moved now uh, 4,700 times. So we know a little bit about moving and we've seen all the permutations or probably most of the permutations of what could happen. 
And so in your scaling, uh, not only are we a listening to our clients and be focusing on, on quality during the growth, but we're also recording and disseminating our learnings. And that becomes harder and harder as you grow because you have more and more learnings, more and more volunteers who make recommendations for how to change or improve the organization and more feedback from the community. So as we grew, we had to quickly learn that in order to remain responsive to our volunteers and to our par community partners, we needed to show them that we were actually taking note of their comments and observations and putting it through a continuous quality loop so that it goes back to our operations team. They take the time to read and, and review the recommendation and then they, they either make a change to our process or they don't. But either way, we have to respond back to our partners so they know that we're listening and that we, we considered their recommendation. Um, when you scale, obviously the risks grow exponentially. And if you value your organization's reputation as much as we value ours, the risk to your reputation grows exponentially as well. Uh, that's more clients who can be dissatisfied, uh, more volunteers who can become disenfranchised or disappointed, um, more opportunity for accidents or negative outcomes in the number of times you deliver your service. So we spend a lot of time, more than ever, reviewing our own risk universe. And I would encourage you and your board and your senior leadership team to look at your organization if you're service delivery or if you're advocacy, it doesn't really matter. There's risk in every type of activity. Um, identify those risks, every conceivable risk, which is kind of an exhausting thing to do and kind of nerve wracking too. But um, as we grew, we realized there were new risks that we had to face at this, at this scale that we didn't have to face when we were just in Toronto. Uh, and so, uh, so, so I constantly reviewing and mitigating risk with your team, I think is very, very important. We, we have a, a, a risk assessment and mitigation committee of the board. And our operations team also has their own uh, regular monthly meetings with all of the managers for each of our set six and soon seven sites who will meet, review the feedback, identify risks that they found in their own chapters, and then develop, identify someone who will develop a plan to mitigate and then disseminate. So it, it starts with listening and learning, analyzing the data, making a, a decision on how you're going to respond to it, and then disseminating that information back to the, to, the, to the person who provided it. And if you're just having a change to your process, writing it down, just writing it down is, it's just, it's a huge help. It's so simple. Um, but when you go from startup, we're used to making decisions on the fly very quickly, uh, changing to a more, a heavier administrative burden of, of, of documenting and cat categorizing, cataloging your processes, and then making sure they're being disseminated and people are being trained on it. Uh, that's a, a big shift from the startup culture to the more established scaling culture that we have experienced. Uh, so, so those are, I think those are kind of the main steps for how we've, we've scaled. I want to talk a little bit now also about our, uh, a way that we manage our volunteers because that's also changed significantly. So uh, at first it was me, as I said, uh, in my van uh, driving around uh, with, you know, two or three volunteers now we're recruiting almost 100 volunteers every month across our six cities. And with scaling, when we need that many people, we need about four to five people per move times 130 moves. What we've noticed in scaling with our volunteers is from a risk perspective, uh, a few things. The first one, maybe the most obvious, is when you're adding more people to an organization, um, uh, you're, you're bringing new people in who may have uh, the wrong intentions. And so we had uh, an attempt at a security breach in our systems by an abuser who was looking for um, his partner. He, uh, last fall, he, he breached our security. He passed all of our screening. He uh, went through orientation and uh, he went on a number of moves. And I'm being transparent with you about that. Uh, it's very, it's very um, embarrassing that this happened. Um, I'm telling it to you mainly because no, no actual material harm came from the event. We identified him, we removed him from the organization immediately and, cut and locked him out of all of our systems. And when he was on the move, we spoke to all of the families and all the referring agencies and all of the volunteers. And he performed very well on the move, happy to say. But that was just by luck. Um, maybe he was there looking for his partner. Maybe he was there just trying to redeem himself. I don't know. And frankly, I don't care. He has no place in our organization. Uh, and so when we are recruiting 100 new people every month and, and, and uh, 
you know, and adopting and looking for those, especially men and male identifying folks. We have now a, a series of many, many, many more security protocols, including Google searches and social media background searches. We do regular police reference checks, of course. We do screening interviews. We monitor our volunteers on the moves and, and, and other things that I, I can't even mention because we do them in the background to, to keep an eye on our people. Um, so no system is perfect, but I think we've learned a lot from that. And as we scale, we have to take that increasing more and more seriously. Um, the, the, the outcome of that is that we are an organization where everyone can be involved. And I think that is, uh, a challenge for a lot of women serving organizations. Um, I'm a guy, I, I'm a male presenting person with a wife and kids, and it probably wouldn't be always appropriate for me to just knock on the door of a shelter and say, hey, I'm here to help and, uh, you know, start serving meals or something. I, that's not appropriate. But, you know, I'm not a little guy. I can move boxes. I can drive a truck. Um, I can operate with compassion. I can try to show allyship. And I think this has been uh, one of Shelter Movers' distinguishing features is that it really is an opportunity for men to be part of the solution to ending gender-based violence. And I, I, I say this with all of the respect that the equity seeking movement has achieved over the last few decades. But shelter movers really views gender-based violence not as a women's issue. Uh, gender-based violence is a men's issue. It's about men and what men are raised to believe and how men are raised to behave. Uh, until we engage men and give those men who reject the patriarchy and reject misogyny uh, a chance to engage in the solving the problem, um, we're, we're leaving cards on the table, we're leaving money on the table and resources and, and ingenuity and, and passion that Shelter Movers, I think, has tapped into very effectively. And so uh, our goal is to make sure that we have a, a good gender split on all of our moves. We prefer to have women in leadership positions because that's what our clients uh, tend to prefer. But we've got great guys who, who, who understand allyship very deeply and who are committed to being um, being whatever the client needs them to be at the time. Uh, and, and uh, you know, as we all know on this call, probably uh, survivors who experience trauma may not make decisions the same way someone who's not experienced trauma might. Uh, it might take longer. There might be more insecurity or less confidence in making the decision. Maybe the abuser has been telling her she can't make decisions on her own for years and years and years, and she's internalized that, that belief. And, uh, and our, 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 particularly for our guys, um, we, we remind them that their job is to, to provide the client with all the options and then wait and wait some more and wait some more and answer more questions and keep waiting until she, we get her to that point where she's confident and then she gives us direction and then we act. And anything short of that really is not, not in line with our principles and values. Our job is to wait for her direction and to empower her with options until she's confident with how she'd like to proceed. Um, when, we, when you're scaling, um, that, that problem amplifies with the number of people you're bringing into the group because we have, as, as we all know, this, the, justice, the gender justice movement, the equity seeking movement has many different veins to it, many different branches, some more militant than others, uh, some more uh, receptive to male uh, involvement than others. And so we find ourselves probably on one, end, one very end of the spectrum where we say men are very welcome in the organization. We actually want men to be part of the solution. We need them to be part of the solution. Uh, and so scaling requires us to make sure that that's done as safely as possible because we are perhaps in, in a very small way sort of pulling the equity seeking movement in that direction in our, in our sphere of influence. And, and uh, it would only take one negative event to harm our reputation and harm what we're trying to say to the equity seeking movement in terms of the inclusion of men if we have examples of negative outcomes because of that. So we carry that risk with us when we urge our movement to adopt the principles and, and practices that we've done. Uh, and that just goes up as you're in more and more cities talking to more and more shelters. Uh, we work with about 500 uh, various women or you know, trauma serving um, organizations across the country. Um, and so you can imagine we hear a lot of opinions across that array of views on this issue. Um, but we prove ourselves over and over again because of, of the training and the close monitoring that we apply to our volunteers. So that was a little bit about volunteers. Um, uh, and then, and then maybe we just, I'll just talk quickly about money. Um, it's always about money, isn't it? Um, 
So scaling for us, when we started uh, in 2016, it was my, my wife let, us, let me spend some of our money. We were renting the trucks out of our pocket. We were renting a storage unit out of our pocket. I was buying boxes. Um, obviously, it's not sustainable. Um, eventually, I paid myself back after a few years, um, but, uh, but it, was, uh, it was pretty expensive to start. And so if you're in a startup phase, I would just, I would just caution you know, I, I would just caution you to manage your passion with your checkbook, which I think is obvious to say, but sometimes passion outweighs the money we have and we bleed ourselves dry with funding trying to get something started and it doesn't go. Um, I would recommend in the early stages of, of scaling, um, and we were fortunate this way, um, uh, don't use your own personal money to do the startup. Don't... I don't like to say don't start things until something happens because that's always not realistic. But I would say, as you develop your concept for your for your service or your advocacy organization or whatever, spend as much time as you do developing your service or your concept as you do um, once you once you develop it. Spend as much time uh, pitching it to not just friends and family, but but have the passion to reach out to local businesses. Uh, family foundations, Trillium Foundation in Ontario, or the equivalent in your in your own province, um, because we were discovered by the uh, a local Toronto Family Foundation, uh, and uh, and so I went in with her with, with the the owner of the operator of the foundation, and, and she'd done her homework on our service, and and I and and she sort of turned that light on for me, saying, you know, you can't do this out of your pocket forever, and you've got a great idea. And this particular foundation's purpose was to find new innovative uh, services and, and, and infuse some seed money to get them going. Um, I think that's a critical aspect of growth. As we scale, currently we have about 51 employees across the country. Most of them, a lot of them are part-time, so sort of 50-50 part-time, full-time split. Um, and as I said, we're about a $3 million, $3.5 million operation. Um, and so our our determination as we scaled about the number of volunteers we had to manage was greatly influenced by our funding. Uh, you may have the greatest volunteers in the world, uh, but you may still feel tempted to hire to provide that sense of stability. I can tell you, um, don't fall for the sense of stability. Um, it may sound counterintuitive, but when you find the unicorns that we find it in, in, in the public who are these incredibly dedicated humans who are doing this on the side of their desk or at night, um, their output and their reliability is honestly on par with any employee who works in our organization. Um, and that's because our message, I think, really resonates with a lot of different types of people. So we get a lot of people in late career, um, a lot of students, uh, graduate students doing their work, and a lot of folks who work in maybe for-profit business that just are looking for meaning in their lives. And we, as we scaled, we quickly learned that asking of our volunteers the same as we ask of employees was the right move. We expect our clients to expect deserve nothing but the absolute top quality service. So volunteer or paid is really of no consequence to me. A volunteer is expected to provide the same level of service as any paid employee. Money does not fall into the equation in our organization. Um, and so in our scaling phase, we have really, because of the financial pressure, when we do hire, we've really leaned on volunteers as, as unpaid employees, if I can call them that. We treat them like employees. They have, uh, um, we, uh, whenever we can, we offer health benefits um, to all of our paid employees and some of our unpaid employees. Um, we have mat leave now for our employees. We don't have it for volunteers yet because 2,000 2, volunteers, you know, 60% female, 70% female could be uh, too expensive to be able to fulfill. Um, but, um, but, you know, we, 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 we really do treat our volunteers as we grow uh, as much as employees, paid employees, as we do our, our salaried staff. Um, and that makes us much more uh, flexible to growth and much more amenable to uh, adding new cities without incurring huge, huge costs. Um, so thinking about our volunteers a little bit differently has been a big learning. Um, I, I, I'm mindful of time. It's 1024. Um, do I have a few more minutes, Helena? Are we good for a couple more? Okay. So... So I guess maybe the last area I'll talk about is um, is our expectations and our culture in it within our employees. This has been probably for me personally the hardest part of our scaling. Uh, I'm a founder and I love shelter movers 
Uh, I joke that I love my children um, and I would never give my children to anyone. Uh, and I love shelter movers and I can't give it to anyone either, um, which is not so great when you're trying to scale. Um, but uh, to the founders in the group or to people who've been in the organization for a long time and feel personal uh, attachment to their organization, uh, scaling means uh, uh, giving your baby away. It means you're trusting the thing that you've devoted your life to, to somebody else who you may know really well, but um, you may need to tell yourself and hear from them that they love this baby like you love this baby. Um, and, and as we grow, uh, I, for me to mitigate that feeling of ownership and, con and need to control our message and need to control our brand, I spend a lot of time interviewing and meeting with candidates. We, we hire slow and, and, and fire fast uh, because it doesn't take long for us to identify who those unicorns are and their level of, of, uh, of compassion to our clients being the first criterion, obviously. But, in, but as a second priority, their, their level of, of passion for this organization, for what it represents. Um, we, we are very, very careful about who we bring into the organization at any senior level. Um, a lot of uh, passion and, and enthusiasm is expressed by all of our volunteers, uh, and that wanes uh, in some of them. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, as I said, I came from the private sector. Uh, I, I, I wasn't working at shelter. I was not the first person hired at shelter movers. I hired, uh, Yael Schwartz, who's our national operations director first, cause I wanted her doing the moves because I knew that she would treat our clients exactly or better than I would. Uh, and that really is the bar when I'm hiring you. I don't think I'm too bad at my job and I need you to be as good or better than me because that's what our clients deserve. And so that, uh, you know, I, I've managed to grow the organization surrounded by much smarter people than me, fortunately. Um, but, uh, but unless they're really demonstrating that level of commitment, they, they will not reach the higher levels of our organization. Um, and when I say demonstrate, I don't just mean talk, obviously. I mean, most of our, almost um, the vast majority of our staff were volunteers first. So they were on their hands and knees, scooping toys out from under the bed and putting them in boxes and meeting our clients. They were the ones at the markets uh, in Vancouver, the farmers markets, talking about our service and answering tough questions from people. Um, and so, before money came into the equation, they were already serving our clients with great, uh, great, great love. And so, uh, a resume is great, and degrees are great, but we're a very practical, tangible service, and we expect a very practical, tangible display of commitment to our clients in order to be trusted to uh, lead by example. And as a founder, um, that's the bar I hold for everyone in our senior leadership group. I would trust all of them with my own children. I would trust, I trust them with shelter movers and anything short of that really is not uh, honoring what we're trying to do here. So as you scale, uh, that actually gets easier and easier. If I'm being honest, um, at for uh, my, my founder syndrome is, is waning ever so slightly every time we open it up another chapter and another group shows up. And uh, as I said, I live in Montreal, I live in Toronto, but I'm in Montreal today um, to receive uh, an award for Shelter Movers Montreal's services. And, uh, and to know that I, I've never done a move in Montreal. I've never served a single survivor in our city, but to know that the people here have done uh, such an incredible job to be recognized uh, by YMCA, um, that uh, they uh, they really do uh, own this mission, and maybe maybe this didn't just sit in my head. Maybe this is actually something that's much bigger than than Mark in his basement in his slippers in 2016. Um, this is a, a much bigger creation that we can all look to um, and and uh, and invest in. Uh, and so I think that's part of uh, the scaling journey for any executive director is to open yourself up to the fact that someone might love this as much or more than you do, and that other people will take this idea and lovingly help it evolve and lovingly help it become something you didn't imagine it could be. Just like a kid growing up, we don't know what our kids will be when they grow up, but you're excited for it. And you might have a vision on day one, but it might be something so much more than you had imagined when they're going to university or, or whatever, um, because it came from them. And so I, uh, I, I'd say that's the scaling journey has been a personal journey of growth for me. 
uh, and uh, and for our senior team, many of whom have been around for six years as well. So I don't I don't claim to own this myself. Uh, this is founder syndrome. Our, our leadership team might have a little bit of that too, uh, from the early the the OG the OG crew the old, oh, oh, the original crew that's still with us uh, may have some of that too. Um, so I'll I'll stop maybe there um, in terms of uh, how we grew and and what we what we've experienced. Um, if there are questions, uh, I'll turn it to Helena. But uh, if not, I'll, I'll keep talking about other stuff if, if we don't have questions. But I'll, I'll stop there, maybe, Helena. Well, um, let's see. Uh, this is so fascinating so far. Thanks, Mark. Um, if someone does have a question that they would like to ask Mark, um, there is a blue bar just at the bottom of the video screen that says Q&A. Please put your questions to him there, and we will be able to see those and run them by him. I don't see any questions yet. I have a question for you. I have lots of questions, but while we're waiting for some to come in or if there's something else you want to talk about, um, it, it makes sense. Everything you're saying, it's so important to really be consistent and just really solidify um, you know, the core of this because if you want to grow, I mean, that's what gives it the stability, right? How... How um, or has this even been an issue? There's your organization, then there's your board. So as you scale, has there been any bumps along the road or is there, is there a synchronicity in the vision and, and how they, they see uh, what you're doing and are on board with everything? Or I've had you not just trying to win over partnerships and community, but ha has there been times where you've had to re-win the board or, um, and get their, get their agreement on certain things as you expand? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, it, it's definitely been bumpy. Um, with the board. I, I don't think there's um, any value in hiding that. Uh, in in uh, 2017, uh, we were a year in, and um, uh, Elizabeth Rock, who was the chair of Habitat for Humanity in Ottawa and a friend of mine, contacted me and said, Mark, what's this thing you're doing? I said, oh, we're doing this in Toronto. She says, why don't we have this in Ottawa? I said, because I'm tired. That's why. I, I, I don't sleep with it. She's like, well, I'm helping you do it. We're doing it. We're bringing it to Ottawa. And of course, um, she, she built a team, and it was very controversial with the board. Um, and I think it would be disingenuous of me to suggest that we had everything figured out before we opened our second city. We didn't, we didn't at all. Um, we had a lot of strong volunteers and an alignment of our values and our culture, which I think translated very well. And we transferred that culture and those beliefs to the next city. But we were, uh, there were parts of our, not the operational side, we had that pretty like lockdown, how to do the moves, we had that figured out but like financial processes, how money flowed through the organization, um, our recruitment and vetting process. I mean, the plane had already taken off and didn't have any landing gear. We were building this plane in the sky and it was already flying. Um, wow. And I think, uh, I think it, and the, our board felt very strongly that we should not uh, replicate until we had uh, the whole thing figured out or nearly the whole thing figured out. And I saw it very differently. I saw it through the lens of the people who were committing to making this a success in Ottawa because mm -hmm. I saw and heard and had, had seen with my eyes in Elizabeth Rock uh, a demonstrated, uh, demonstrated uh, leadership success. And so I put my faith in those very special people to carry this torch with them into, into Ottawa and, and stay true to our culture and our ways of doing things. And so uh, we had some board members leave after um, I told them, I said, you, we're, we, we need to go to Ottawa. There are families there that need our service and I'm confident we have the team to do it. We had raised the money in Ottawa to help start it up. And that wasn't enough for some of our board members. They said, you, you haven't figured it out, enough out. And so an honest discussion about risk tolerance took place. Many discussions about risk tolerance took place. And, uh, and we agreed that some of our board members simply did not have the, the tolerance for this type of, of action. They want to see more set up. Uh, but I think fortune favors the bold, um, and, uh, and we were definitely that. Now we have a process, as I mentioned early on in my talk, uh, we have an expansion protocol, which is basically a, a, play, a playbook for how to open a chapter in one's community. So all the steps, it's about a 12 month process of recruitment, of training, fundraising, media, um, accounts, financial setup, 
and it walks them through. And our national leadership team uh, has responsibilities to shepherd and guide new emerging chapters through that process until mm -hmm. each of our functional directors is satisfied that in their function, the chapter has met the bar. Uh, and that's again, getting back to quality through the scaling. So we spend a lot of money paying a lot of humans to keep an eye on new chapters and how they emerge. They do it exactly the same way or better every single time. But yes, for the board, it was, it was, uh, it was controversial and it was, it was a, it was a risk. A few, a few late nights where I'm laying in bed saying, I know we have to do this, but I don't have all the answers. And I, I don't think waiting to have all the answers is actually the right thing to do. Our clients don't have time to wait for that. Our clients need to get out now. We need to get to them and we need to do it safely. So that's a short answer to that, but very good question. Well, that's good. And as a result of that, you've developed this system now, this process, so that you don't have that stumbling block moving forward. That's wonderful. It's a great learning experience. I have a couple of questions in now for you. Um, here is uh, one. Can you name one thing that you see as the biggest learning lesson from all of your experiences? Uh, sure. Um, um, I think one of the biggest, I, I kind of mentioned, I think one of the biggest learning lessons it, from, from this scaling has been uh, to, as I said, acknowledge as a founder that someone else can, can uh, be as devoted to this as I am. Um, and that's a very hard pill to swallow because it, uh, it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that. Um, uh, it's like telling someone that they love your kid as much as you love your kid. That's, that seems impossible, but um, it's, I've been proven wrong. There, there are hundreds and hundreds of people across our country who see the value of shelter movers and who are as invested personally as I am. And uh, it's a shock and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's humbling um, to know that. Um, and I think founders can be very guilty of, uh, of thinking no one can love this as much as I do. And it's just a false, it's a false uh, reality that needs to be dis dispelled very quickly. Um, if I had not come to terms with that, we would not have scaled at all because I would never have been able to give this away to anyone else to, to do, even with my oversight or my team's oversight. Um, so, you know, whether you're a founder or not, um, you know, it sounds a little crass maybe, but every, everyone's replaceable in the sense that, you, you know, I think I, I'm not that special. Just because I started this doesn't mean that I'm the be all and end all for this organization. Quite the contrary. I found people who have figured out problems I'll never be able to figure out. And fortunately, I, the board lets me stay on and, and keep running this thing. But uh, I look forward to the day, actually, honestly, when, we, when I do have to step away and we get to look for someone to, to take this to even another level. Maybe, it, you know, we've had expressions of interest from other countries. Um, there are three groups in France. There's a group in Israel. There's a group in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they want to talk and they want to. And we, we've not stepped into that conversation fully yet because our national growth is our priority for survivors in Canada. But, um, but, uh, but I know now uh, I can walk away eventually walk away from this and it'll be even, it'll be much better than if I stayed. I think that is the matter the, the measure of any founders uh, journey. You have to be able to walk away happily and looking forward to the outcome after you go. And that's saying a lot. I don't think I could have said that even two years ago or three years ago. I would have said, no, like, I'm in this, I'm, I'm, in, I'm all in. This is, this, I've never done any more. Other than having my kids and being married to my wife, this is probably the most important thing I'll ever do in my life. Right. And, and to be able to walk away from that happily is a big deal. And I look forward to that day. Um, so I think that's a big learning. It's amazing. If you instill, uh, you know, as much as you have in this organization, it's almost like... Uh, you're a child growing up and leaving home. You've done your part and uh, you've really clearly established it. So it, you've made it possible for others to clearly grasp and catch your vision. You know what I mean? And so they can continue that for me. It's, it's very impressive. Here's another question. What advice would you give to healthcare providers and educators and first responders? Uh, so we deal with, with, uh, with first responders regularly, whether it's police or um, uh, crisis intervention folks, victim services folks, social workers that are on scene. Um, we work closely with educators. We have teachers who've referred clients to us. Obviously, we work with social workers and counselors and women's shelters. Um, I think um, it's very important when we scale 
Uh, and we've made this mistake in some of our cities where we opened the floodgates really quickly when we established our, our presence, say here in Montreal, for example. And normally when we open a chapter, we try to limit our referring agencies to like one or two at first. We don't need more than that to get the number of clients we need. But in Montreal, we were more aggressive and we, where we normally move um, eight to 10 families every month to start, uh, Montreal came out of the came out of the gate at 16 moves, which is a, a huge pressure on our volunteer base because we 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 recruit to be able to do eight to ten, but doing 16, doing twice as many as we're supposed to, um, is very very demanding and very stressful. And it was a mistake, and we did it because there was so much enthusiasm for this service in Montreal. We had trouble saying no, but I would say um, to those first responders or to community partners. Um, when we open or when anyone opens a new service that gets a lot of attention, managing expectations is the most important thing you can do. We don't say no to any client ever. I mean, as a philosophy of service, we say not yet, give us a couple other days if you can, or we negotiate with, the, with them until we find a, a, a good date that works. But managing expectations with police, uh, with, with, with uh, shelters and, and crisis services has been very important because we need them to trust us. And we need them to understand that we have to grow in a responsible way until we can get to them. Um, and the other thing I would mention to first responders is uh, uh, you're not trained and you're not equipped to do what Shelter Movers does. And that's okay. Uh, I know many examples of police officers very kindly taking the client and her kids in the car. They'll throw a couple of garbage bags in the trunk and they'll drive them to the shelter so she can get there that, that night. And I think that's wonderful. But that is not what we do. Um, and the likelihood that she's going back to get the rest of her things after the police officer does that is slim to nil. It is simply too dangerous for her to do that. So um, I would say that uh, to first responders that you, uh, if, if Shelter Movers is operating in your city, you don't need to worry about that anymore. You can go and do the policing. You can go do the counseling. You can go do all the things that the, these other services are sort of having to try to do some of what we do to fit the need. Um, many examples of, uh, of survivors, um, of, of counselors in shelters driving their own car back to the survivor's house with her, running into the back of the house, grabbing what they can, running out the back door, back in the car and drive. I mean, it's, it's, it's not dignified. It's certainly not safe. Uh, and I would say that I hope they view shelter movers as the remedy to that. We offer a safe and dignified way for survivors to leave on their own terms. And and I, we don't know anyone else who does it quite like we do or, or as reliably or as, as widely as we do. So I would say hopefully we're removing some stress from the, the, the shoulders of, of our partners in the community. Hopefully they view us as valuable and they'll use us as frequently as they can. Amazing. Um, I have a question. Are there, obviously you collaborate with a lot of agencies, are there certain partnerships that are missing that you still need or need more of that... Um, you know, that there's like a four, a minimum 400 people that will ha are or will be viewing this um, that uh, might want to connect with you. Um, so is there something that you can reach out for? I, I love that question. We're always looking for more uh, to grow. Um, so uh, we operate uh, internally. The, the service is free. We don't take payment for the service ever, ever. Uh, but internally, it costs us about $250 to pay for, say, the trucks or the storage or the gas or the, the basic volunteer management costs to do that one move. There are other costs in the organization, but to do that one move is about $250. So, uh, so when, we're, when we ask for donations from the community, we, we ask people to think about, you know, what $250 is about 20 bucks a month. Um, that's a few Starbucks, uh, few Starbucks uh, a month, uh, and that'll, that'll move a woman and and four or five kids in some cases out of an abusive home with all of their belongings to a safe place. Um, so we, we think our value proposition is quite compelling. We, we generate, um, there's been some econometric uh, analysis done of our services and the avoided services of actually breaking the cycle of, of violence because we know women return about six times on average, seven times. Mm -hmm. But if she uses our service, maybe the second or third time, she's much, much less likely to ever go back. And so that relieves police and court and healthcare services from society's expenses and generates about $22,000 in future value 
in immediate future value to society for a $250 investment. So we think it's a good economic value proposition. Excellent. Um, and, and, and we have relationships with, uh, with trucks and storage companies. So we always need relationships with, with truck companies if people know them or storage companies. We, have, uh, we need those, those relationships to secure more space and, and move more families. Well, that makes sense. Let's see. Are there any other questions? Oh, it's going to finish any minute now. So I, I want to thank you so much, Mark. That was just so amazing. And uh, just continued success in all that you do. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Great Laura. work, Mark. Great work, wow. Alina. I'm so inspired. You're good. You're natural. Yeah, you both are. It was wonderful. Oh, yeah. Oh, I just, yeah, the passion for what you do is amazing. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know I, I saw their uh, health care. Oh, no, we got, the, we got those questions. Super. Fantastic. Everyone, yeah, you got it all. Good job. Excellent. Well, we, we did run past, but that's good. We can clip it, oh. so we'll put it in there. <laughs> and um, thank you again. This was a wonderful experience. You can't see my face. There I am. Yay. Yeah, it was wonderful. So very, yeah, very slides. informative. Great work that you're doing. Thank you so much for participating in this event. Thank this has been you. a pleasure to have you. My pleasure's mine. Thank you. And, and, and congratulations on your another award. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Yeah, it's fun. Um, and the, uh, uh, the slides will go out, as you said, somewhere in the, yes, in the I'm going to put the slides in the abuse hurts booth for people to pick up so they can perfect. review them anytime. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so Have much. Great. Take care. Thanks. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. Elena, we're ready for the next.